Hello, and welcome to Living Faith Lutheran Church. I wanted to take a moment to welcome each and every one of you and give you a little insight into who we are and what we're about before we begin worship today. The name of our congregation is, of course, Living Faith, and the word congregation is inclusive of all those who choose to worship with us, no matter where they are in the world. The reality is we're no longer defined by a simple physical address. The Martin Luther in me wants to ask the question, what does this mean? It means that the Holy Spirit has powerful things in store and the daily and the, and daily the Spirit is broadening our horizons and beckoning, motivating, urging and pushing us to a deeper actualization of our name. Thanks, Pastor. That really cleared that all up. What this means is that I was thinking about our name and I had one of those schoolhouse rock moments when I realized that the living in our name functions both as an adjective and as a verb. As an adjective, living describes the noun faith as one with, as Luther would describe it, a profound love of God for God's people and for all of the whole creation. As a verb, what that's where things get exciting. As we worship, and worship is not just this short video time in the midst of a 168 hour week, worship is about living faith. The Schoolhouse Rock song says, verb, I get my thing from action, to work, to play, to live, to love. All 168, 24 seven, 365, until our faith becomes sight in the kingdom of God. So we wish you peace and invite you to live faith with us whenever you, wherever you reside on our planet, to be active and to bring justice, hope, peace, and comfort to a hurting world, to clothe the naked, to lift up the lowly, to bring healing to the sick, to feed the hungry, to console the brokenhearted, and to make Christ known both in both word and deed. If you so desire, if you're searching for a church family either to worship with in person or from afar, a family with which to share your joys and sorrows and triumphs and failings, your hopes and your fears, your gifts and your talents, we want you to know that you're welcome with us. And I would be remiss if I didn't make, uh, make, it aware, make everyone aware that you can subscribe to our newsletters and find my contact information at livingfaithlutheran.org. We hope to hear from you. God bless, and let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God, both now and forever. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them and, and saved them from the grave. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving and in all his works. The Lord upholds all who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed and ministers to them in their illness. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. We are made God's people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, 
we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And let us pray. O God, you give us your Son as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Acts, the eighth chapter, verses 26 through 40. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that was that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask? Does the prophet say this about himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is selected verses from Psalm 22. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to the people yet unborn, saying to them, 
The Lord has acted. The second reading is from 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has sent for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Word of God, word of Christ, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does, uh, whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches, branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. It didn't take very long for me, after I read this passage, to be struck by a very simple question. In the context in which Jesus is speaking, what is fruit in the metaphor? On its face, it seems pretty simplistic, and you might be now asking yourselves, how did this guy manage to graduate in Christian ed and make it through seminary? But I gathered enough courage the other day to ask the question of my friends in our pastor's study group. There was silence. All I could think of was, they think I'm an idiot. But what happened was that we all began to think and consider the interpretations 
over the years and what we were thinking and their impact, those ideas impact on the church. I think the passage has traditionally made folks think of growing churches and putting people in seats. This became the thrust of the passage, and the implication is that if you are not having to add more services and pews and build bigger buildings, you are somehow not connected to the vine, and that you're not bearing fruit. I don't think this is true, and I don't think it is scripturally supported. So, what's fruit? And what do we know about vines? Well, I'm no vine dresser, believe me, but when we bought a house years ago in North Carolina, there was a scuppernong vine there. It had posts and lines for the vines and for the branches to run on. The necessity, uh, all the necessities of a great producing setup. I was told about how, uh, about all the great wine and jellies that had come from that vine over the years. Well, I was excited at the prospect of free fruit. There was a gentleman that went to our church named Ray. And after Christmas Eve service every year, Ray would catch you in the parking lot and hand you a bottle of homemade wine. He was always desperate for bottles of all kinds because that one man had a very plentiful set of vines. I always wondered what his vineyard and vines looked like. His vineyard was, of course, not in his yard in town, and I didn't want to be too nosy early on. It turns out, though, that, th that his vineyard was in walking distance from where I grew up, uh, and that was across town from where I then lived. I had passed his vines countless times through my life. I had never noticed them. They were not spectacular, not being a vigneron. Okay, so I had to look that word up because I thought grape grower sounded mighty unsophisticated. So a vigneron is a grape grower. I wouldn't know a good grapevine from a hole in the ground. But I did know that he had good vines by the massive amount of great fruit that they produced. You could taste and smell their goodness. The surprising thing is that the vines seemed so small for what they were doing. They were tight and trimmed off. I always was perplexed uh, whenever I would drive by after that, after I knew what I was looking at. How on earth are those vines doing that? And how on earth does Ray keep it all up? Well, one answer is that Ray absolutely loved what he was doing. He loved growing grapes, making wine, making people happy, showing you his very simple operation in his half basement in town, and supplying I don't know how many churches with free communion wine. I bet wine sales in Lincoln County, North Carolina, probably tripled when Ray passed away. So yes, lots of fruit. Now back to my vine. It was one long vine, and it was huge. It was completely nuts, because no one had lived there for several years, and no one uh, took care of it. No vigneron. It had grown. So it was big. So big that it had run up a really big silver maple tree and was killing it. It, was all, it had already demolished a once very fruitful apple tree. It was huge. Leaves everywhere. Clip, 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 cut, 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 and it made no difference. Seemingly unconquerable, indestructible, 
massive and unyielding. And there was not one single grape on it. Prune it? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. Maybe me and an army. It just kept spreading and seeking to overtake more and more. The best day and the solution day was when my cousin drove his tractor over and rolled that monstrosity into a giant ball with a front end loader. He disconnected it from the earth. As it dried, well, it would have made a, a pretty Christmas tree ornament. Well, if it was thousands of times smaller. Jesus' metaphor makes good sense to me after that experience. So big, even massive, seemingly healthy vines do not translate to good fruit or abundant fruit or a fantastic combination of the two. Sometimes they yield no fruit at all. The branches that are connected to the vine and the earth and abide the vigneron's shaping, direction, and nourishment, they bear fruit. Not necessarily big, but wonderfully made for the job. So what's the fruit if it's not massive buildings filled with people, overflowing new member classes, and all that sort of thing? Well, we are told in the fifth chapter of Galatians, using the same metaphor, what fruit is. It turns out it goes to the heart of the believer, to the actions, to the behavior, to putting into action what Jesus told everyone over and over and over again, and that was to be loving and merciful. In Galatians, it lists nine fruits of the Holy Spirit that give us a pretty good idea of what our output should be, what our fruit should be. Let's use the original Greek words just for fun. Well, and also because some of the words have a much deeper meaning than their English translations. The first fruit is agape, or love. But wait, there are at least four Greek words uh, for love in Greek. Love agape, that type of love, is unconcerned with the self and concerned with the greatest good of another. Fruit number two is kara, or joy. Joy is different than happiness in that happiness is a feeling centered on the self. But joy goes much deeper and is linked with sacrifice and thinking of others and abounds from the connection to God in Christ. The third fruit is arene, or peace. That is the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing, and, and therefore fearing nothing from God. So you feel and exhibit not having to prove anything, and that you don't have to earn God's love. The fourth is um, macrothemia, or patience. The word denotes lenience, forbearance, fortitude, patient endurance, and long-suffering. Also included in macrothemia is an ability to endure persecution and ill treatment. It describes a person who has the power to, exer uh, to exercise revenge, but instead exercises restraint. The fifth is krestotes, or kindness. Sounds simple, but one scholar has noted that when the word krestotes is applied to interpersonal relationships, it conveys the idea of being adaptable to others, 
rather than harshly require everyone else to adapt to their own needs and their desires. When Christotus is working in a believer, they seek to become adaptable to the needs of those who are around them. The sixth fruit is agath, uh, agath, excuse me, agathosine, or goodness. This word doesn't appear in secular Greek. It's a purely biblical term. It's an uprightness of the heart and life. And that, trans, and that transmits the goodness of God or the light of Christ to others. The next fruit is pistos, or faithfulness. That is one who believes and is worthy of trust that can be relied on. The next fruit is prautes, or gentleness. Prautes indicates a disposition that is even-tempered, tranquil, balanced in spirit, unpretentious, and that has passions under control. The word is best translated as meekness, not as an indication of weakness, that sort of gets confused in our English language, but of power and strength under control. The person who possesses this quality pardons injuries, corrects faults, and rules their own spirit well. The last named fruit, which I'm sure this list is not completely exhaustive, is ekratia, or self-control, meaning, uh, meaning strong, having mastery, able to control one's thoughts and actions. So when we exhibit these actions, all of these fruits, the, and these motives, we are bearing fruit. The neat thing about the fruit metaphor is that the fruit is where the seed is developed and carried. Oftentimes the fruit is the attractor of the animals that carry the fruit away and aid in the dispersal of the seeds. When we bear fruit, seeds get planted. Not seeds of our own desires or that are focused on ourselves, but seeds that do perpetuate the vine. They grow the kingdom of God. Notice bearing the fruit is the focus. When and where the fulfillment of growth comes is not under our control. It is beyond us. That's on the wings and in the winds of the Spirit. We can see, I think, um, we can see, I think, we can know deep within us how this type of love and focusing on others how that type of ministry works to grow the kingdom. However, so often we get detoured by church growth strategies, waylaid by overly intricate theologies and philosophies, and so concerned with survival that we just want bigger branches. And we are so distracted, we never bear fruit. So many in this world are forgotten. They're lost. They're hungry. They're in need of love, understanding, justice, food, basic necessities, or a friend that loves them as they are, or someone who just cares. I think by our connection to the vine, the vine that showed us the way on the cross and that kind of connection to us, we have been given, we have been blessed, and we have been entrusted with the ability to bear the fruit that can feed the world and cure all of these hungers. I may not be a vigneron, 
but at least now I know what fruit is. Till next week, amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. God of all fruitfulness, you abide in your church and your church abides in you. Cleanse us by your word and give yourself to the whole church on earth so that it bears fruit and witnesses to your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have created the heavens and the earth. As we wander at the beauty of creation, may we seek vital connections among all that depends on the earth for life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule the nations with justice and love. Give the leaders of the earth assurance of your abiding presence, that they lead not by fear, but with love, for those they are called to serve. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You have loved us so that we can love others. We pray for all in need of your love, those who are poor, lowly, outcast, weak, or fearful. Provide for the needs of all, especially your servants on our prayer list, those who are suffering the far-reaching ill effects of COVID-19, and those whom we name aloud are in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You gather us with all the saints by the power of your Spirit. With them may our hearts live forever in your keeping. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus, the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.